Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, welcome. Happy New Year. It's 2024 if you're listening live. How was your new year? We have a fresh new year. What is it that you want to create with this new year? It's making me think I didn't do an end of the year episode. Oh, that's okay. Just got to move on. Today's episode is kind of interesting. I'm speaking with Ellie who wants to be anonymous. So not any picture on the cover art today. No last name. You just get to know my guest is Ellie and I will read her bio. But she took the online HSP course and she reached out to me before the course started and said, I'm autistic. Does it work for me to take the course? And we talk about that a little bit in this episode about what her concerns were taking the course being autistic. How was it being in a group with people that identify as HSP? Did that work for her? Did it not work? I think it's a really informative episode and it's interesting. I, I just finished recording, so I haven't had a lot of time to reflect, but I think the tone of this interview, if you've been a long time listener and you've listened to other episodes with people that have taken the course, I think this is different. And I was trying to think as I was saying that, what feels different? I think Ellie assesses things a little bit more analytically and cognitively than some of the previous guests. And I, I could be wrong. I probably need to sit with this. If this is offensive to you, Ellie, let me know. We can talk about it. It's just an interesting interview. And we talk about what was different about this group. Ellie has had the experience of being in lots of groups. And so she really had a nice perspective about how this group was different. I, I don't know. I, I think it's kind of interesting. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I want to tell you about the episode. I don't think so. I feel like I should be telling you something, but I don't know what it is. Let me tell you a little bit about Ellie. Ellie is a corporate professional in a senior manager position. Through experiencing significant burnout, she was identified as autistic earlier last year. Her formal diagnosis followed. Leading up to her diagnosis and through today, she has been searching for information to help her understand her autism and for strategies for managing the seemingly endless effort it takes to be her in a world that expects her not to be autistic. If you are autistic, that will make sense to you. If you are not autistic and you don't understand what that means, that's okay. One of the things I think I do want to share is Ellie and I have been working together on course content creation for some courses for autistic folks. If you suspect you're autistic, if you're newly diagnosed, we haven't gotten to the last course that we're going to work on although I don't know how much time Ellie's going to have because she had a little bit more time during this period of burnout where we were able to collaborate. But the last group we were going to work on was a group for autistic professionals. We'll see how that happens. But it's really been a delight for me to collaborate with Ellie. I think we're a great yin and yang and there are executive functioning skills that she has that I really lack. And I think there's some areas that I have some strengths that aren't as strong for her. So it's really been a beautiful collaboration. I don't normally collaborate with people to take the course. So it just happened to be this way. Anyways, I think that's all I have to say. And now on to the show. Hey, Ellie, how are you? I'm great. How are you, Patricia? I'm doing okay. We decided to record spontaneously. We've been collaborating on some curriculum for some new autism groups and we decided we'd record instead. So this is a little spontaneous, I think, for both of us. How are you <laughs> feeling about recording? Well, my autistic side uh, is anti-spontaneity, but my ADHD side is loving it. I know. It's so funny how which whichever one is present or more forward. What were your thoughts about the group before we even started? I was a little wary of jumping into an HSP group because mm -hmm. generally, especially these days, it seems to me like HSP and autism discussions tend to stay separated. And so I'd been sort of listening to your podcast on and off for a very long time. 
And I was curious about the course, but I wasn't really thinking of participating in it until you mentioned that you were looking into autism yourself. And Mm -hmm. so that made me trust you and the course enough because I knew that you would know enough about sort of what's going on and the discussions around autism that you, you know, you wouldn't end up being inadvertently hurtful or dismissive about it. Even if people don't intend to be harmful, sometimes just discussions around autism can end up being pretty challenging. So Mm -hmm. that was the reason that I considered it. And I was still pretty wary because I knew that it was going to be a course that was centered on the HSP experience. And while I came to autism through an HSP lens, I definitely have been focused more on autism lately. Sure, sure. And you reached out to me ahead of time and said, hey, I'm autistic. Does it work for me to take the course? So we had a little bit of a discussion about that once you decided to take the course. Yeah. And that was really helpful for me because I also wanted to have you know from the outset that I'm autistic and that it was something that was going to be showing up in whatever way it did throughout the course. And your response really made me feel comfortable that you weren't going to, I don't know, have me sit in a corner or something metaphorically. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd be in the corner with you. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. But it was it was really encouraging. And then also your sort of follow up to the potential group members about this is the environment that I want to create in the group. And this is, you know, sort of what you're signing up for. That really gave me a lot of comfort that I was in the right place. Are you talking about the email that I send out initially? Yes. Yes. Okay. So for the listeners, if you don't know what we're talking about, when somebody lets me know that they're interested in the course, I, I, <laughs> I actually call it kind of my repel video and I have an email And this started during the last couple of years during COVID when we had a lot of political things happen. And I just state that I'm so inarticulate, so I'm not even going to say what it is. But there's an email that I send out that says, these are the things that I stand for and that I represent. And if these are things that are not okay with you, this isn't the group for you. And while we all have stuff that goes on, you need to be able to recognize that you have something going on if it's going on and name it. I don't expect anybody to have worked through all of their stuff. We all have things that come up, but it, it's it's a way to gauge where people are in their awareness and in their process. And if you know you have stuff and you can name it, that's great. So that's what you're talking about. And I have felt reluctant about having it, but I find that I get the best group of attendees when people are really clear about what's going to happen. Because during one of the HSP courses we had, my mind is kind of, it's skipping a little bit, but with George Floyd. And so that was something that came up. And and so talking about racism, talking about sexism and talking about, I don't know, can you help me with some of the other things that we talk about that are in that first email? Just sort of the right human rights, just respect for humanity, empathy for others, things like that, that are just kind of core things for a lot of people. If you're LGBTQIA, if you're in that community, we're supportive. If you're neurodivergent, we're supportive. So that there's room and space for marginalized groups that typically don't get respect and support. And that's really important to me. And so I want to make that clear from the onset. It's not a political group by any means, but in the last four or five years, we've gone through some pretty intense things in the world. And so we have to negotiate each group about how we're going to navigate that. Yeah. And I mean, to me, I think it's it's a little bit, I mean, we're all informed by all of our identities, right? And so the idea that we could just divorce some of our identities from our HSP or in my case, autistic identities just seems to be a little bit of a, a fiction to me where if we take an intersectional approach, which that is where we started in this discussion. I mean, I feel like that really respects the whole person and allows people, my hope at least, that people can show up as their whole selves. Because I think a lot of us who identify as HSP or autistic are not used to being able to show up as our whole selves in any respect, regardless of our other identities. Right. And then we often have other areas that are marginalized. And then those parts also don't get respected or. Yeah. So anyways. Okay. 
feeling like I'm stumbling over my words today. And I guess that's just what you get today. I mean, it is a hard topic to put words around. So, I mean, I, I do think that that's, to me, another thing that that represented for me was that you were creating a situation where you weren't afraid to take on the hard conversations, even if they are conversations that, you know, are sometimes lead, lead us to stumble around. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Did you think you'd get anything out of the group? <laughs> so I know in one of your episodes a while back, you talked about how you're used to being disappointed. Mm -hmm. I am very much cut from the same cloth on that. And so I was cautiously optimistic. I'd listened to your podcast. I really thought your perspective on a lot of things resonated with me. And so I thought, well, okay, if you're leading the group and we have people who came to it through your podcast or through working with you or something like that, then odds are good that there would be something that I would get out of it. But I can't say that I was expecting necessarily to get anything out of it, but I was hoping that there would be something that I could take away with me. Yeah, yeah. I think it's also really common. I'm going to speak through the lens of autism. My census just was true for me when I identified as HSP. What I hear often is that autistics come to therapy having a lot of insight and being able to name what they struggle with. And therapists will often say, you have such great insight, what can I do for you? And part of what the role of me in, in this, not that the group is therapy, but I'm just really struggling today with my words. So I just get to lean into it and embrace it. That part of it is that you may have a lot of insight into yourself and your process. And my job is to see how that fits into the bigger picture. And to name what things you're getting stuck with, where you might have some, maybe having a different perspective is helpful, reframing. And I think that that's something that is different about this group. I know you gave me a list of questions that I gave you that you wanted to answer. We're diverting a little bit. Are you comfortable responding to what I just said? Yeah, no, I actually, I think that is one of the unexpected things that I got out of the class is that Definitely, I am. I've heard this from a lot of other people who are late diagnosed autistics, but I've always spent a lot of my time. It's always been a major interest for me looking into sort of psychology and how people work and just studying people. And that included studying myself and how I related with the world and everything. And so having the autistic lens on that provided both more in the way of kind of explanation of how I was you know, how I am the way I am, but also avenues for further discovery and, and learning more. And so I have spent a lot of time looking at things and learning about how people interact. And it was clear that some of the people in the course had spent less time on that and the, you know, were less comfortable with some of the concepts. And I didn't feel like there was any difference in how we all participated fully in the course in that it was really fun to be able to share ideas with people who hadn't, you know, necessarily encountered them before. And then also just because people hadn't been nerding out about specific ways that people are wired as much as I have didn't mean that they couldn't te teach me anything either. What did you think during and after the first group? I like to reserve my judgment because if I make an initial sort of knee-jerk reaction, it's usually going to be more negative than it would be if I just waited and gathered more information. And that being said, I don't feel... I, it definitely wasn't negative after the first course, but I also don't feel like the first course really gave me any significant indication of how valuable the rest of it was going to be because mm -hmm. it was, you know, it's always, I think it's especially hard, at least for me to be in a group of people that I don't know. And so at the beginning, I think a lot of other people were having that, you know, feelings around that too. And so it was, it's interesting because I'm used to being in groups where it's not all neurodivergent or HSP or, you know, however identified people. And everybody just jumps right in and gets going right away. And I felt like this group was slower to warm up, but in a way that made it a lot more comfortable for me. 
Mm-hmm. It's interesting because I have a really different perspective that I thought there was pretty good cohesion on the first group. And I'm not debating what you're saying, but based on my experience, it seemed like there was some pretty good open sharing on the first group. And everybody is entitled to their own experience. So I hope that doesn't feel negating to you. Oh, not at all. And I, I guess I was just trying to put myself back in the first group. I felt like there was what looked like a lot of open sharing, but I didn't trust it until I got to know everybody. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, it is new and people don't know what to expect. I think especially in that the first couple of groups when people talk about what are your concerns? How did you learn about being an HSP? What do you like? What do you not like? That often when people will say things, they'll say anybody else feel that and all hands go up. And so that sense of commonality and not being alone. I think we did a lot of that the first group. But again, I don't want it to make it sound like I'm trying to push that this is the best thing in the world if you were more slow to warm up. Well, I mean, I do think that there was room for people to kind of participate how they wanted to and that you would leave room for people to speak, but you weren't dragging anybody out of their shell uh, if they were uh, like me, kind of slower to venture out there. And honestly, even from the first day, it, it really felt like I was more a participant in the group than an observer, which is not something that I come by very frequently. Yeah. Yeah. And for anybody that's an introvert that is slow to warm up, you never have to share. You don't have to participate. You can turn your camera off. You can eat. You can be in your bed. You really try and make this as neurodivergent friendly. So whatever works for you is totally fine with me. And what was great about that is I am number one to turn off my camera the second anybody says you can turn your camera off. Mm -hmm. And I had my camera off for about the first half of the first group. And then I was like, no, it's fine. I'm just going to leave it on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And people did turn their cameras off. And that's really an OK thing. And we often have to push through so much. And I suspect this is true for HSPs and autistics. We take in so much information. Our brains process five to ten times more than somebody who's holistic, who's not HSP, not autistic. And visually, we take in so much that sometimes just eliminating the visual stimulation can really help to reduce that sense of overstimulation. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Did you get what you were hoping for from the course? No, I had pretty low hopes. And I have to say, I got way more and way more I got a significantly broader experience out of the course than I expected. I sort of expected to come away with maybe some tips on how to incorporate HSP slash autistic friendly things into my life going forward to make it easier. I didn't expect to have a group of people that every week showed up, wrestled difficult things, helped each other through whatever we were going through that week and just genuinely listened. And it was, it was pretty new for me. <laughs> yeah. So I got, I got way more out of it than I would even have allowed myself to hope. Yeah. So what would you say that you got out of the course? I would say, <laughs> this is going to sound really cheesy, but I actually got a bunch of friends out of it, which I wasn't expecting. Mm -hmm. But also it was so normalizing to be in a place where everybody had some overlap and all of the things, maybe not all of the things, but a lot of things that I heard, you're too much or this is too fill in the blank. We were all used to being told we were too whatever. And so recognizing that we could all be too whatever together was a really, really fun and kind of it was a, a good bonding experience and it was also a good sort of reality check in the, yeah, maybe not everybody has these experiences, but there are definitely people who have these experiences and especially as somebody who's autistic, who I'm used to being in spaces where it's autistics, you know, like an autistic focused discussion space or a, you know, whatever focused discussion space. And being the only person who identified as autistic in the group, I didn't feel like I was the odd person out. I didn't feel like it was everybody else. And then me, it, it was just like we had so many things in common, everybody in the group, even if we were from different identities or different places or 
there were a lot of differences among us, but there were so many sort of universal experiences within the group that it was validating and it was a lot of fun to be able to just say something like, oh, that really hit me hard and I had to go take some time in my room or something like that and have everybody else respond, you know, with knowing nods instead of with a, okay, well, that seems a little extreme. Right, right. And the demographics of the group were very different. We had people that were younger, I would say maybe a 20 year span in age. Mm -hmm. Some people are partnered. Some people have kids that are grown. Some people have kids that are teens. Some people don't have kids. Some people are not partnered socioeconomically, education. I mean, there really was a pretty wide range. But I think this is the gift of being in a group of folks that are neurodivergent, that there's enough that is common, although everybody has a very different presentation. But that commonality, I I think, is where there's a sense of like, you know, I'm I'm home. These people get me. Yeah, that was really great. And also it was, it was honestly, it was a little frustrating at first because I was definitely part of this, but everybody was sort of apologizing just kind of as a knee jerk for like, oh, I've been talking too long. I'm so sorry. Or, oh, I've been, oh, I'm taking over the conversation because we're all used to having, feeling like we have to say things like that. And I definitely, you know, I wasn't an exception. I was preoccupied with performing, you know, normal for the Mm -hmm. first, normal in quotes for the first meeting or two just because we were all in our sort of default setting as being the ones who stick out in the group. But I think it's not that I've completely kicked the habit of over apologizing, but I I feel like there was a little bit of a more room around that and more understanding that we're all coming from the same place in that respect. Yeah, that wouldn't have too much. (laughs) That's a big one. I think you talked about this, but I want to give you another opportunity if you have anything else. What was unexpected? Yeah, I think it was just how quickly and how thoroughly everybody just sort of came together and participated and just kind of showed up. I've been in different sort of group places before, and it's never been something where it seemed like people were all in as much Mm -hmm. as in this course. Mm Mm-hmm. What is it about this course that's different? Because what I heard you say is you've been in group settings before. So what was different about this one? Yeah, so I think that this one benefited from having maybe a larger or sort of a more diverse group of people in it. There are some similarities. I've been in sort of autistic only groups before where we're all sort of coming to the fact that we have the same experience in certain areas, which is really validating. And that's something that I also experienced in this course. But in this one, it seemed to me like it was, I felt like everybody was just genuinely meeting people where they were. And it wasn't limited to, oh, I checked this autistic box and I checked that, you know, ADHD box. It was a little bit more, well, I feel like this in this sort of situation. And so I felt like it was a little bit more organic and a little bit less kind of pigeonholed or or kind of boxed up, I guess. And so we ended up having some really valuable discussions and recognizing that maybe in places where we didn't think we overlapped, it grew into, well, maybe we are actually all having similar experiences, but it's showing up in different ways. And I think the depth of the conversations that we had is really something that that distinguishes it from the other courses. And another thing is that it, it felt really organic in how we had topics, we had optional homework, and we could sort of dive into topics before the group or or just show up, but that it still felt very organic and it didn't feel like we were, you know, I know you've run the group before, but it, it felt very personalized to us and it felt very much like we were sort of directing the course and that you were making sure that how our discussions shaped kind of throughout the process was going to be responsive to what we needed to be talking about. And I thought that that kind of personalized attention within a framework worked out really well. 
And as I was thinking about this, it was sort of funny because I usually like the checklist and like orderly boxes of things. But in this case, I think that that uh, sort of the flexibility that you could guide us through sort of something, a framework, but that was tailored to us specifically felt like it was a really, really great, really hands on and really thoughtful process. Hmm. It really is about what the group wants and and allowing each group to form and create what works for them as a group. What I love is that we've got this great curriculum. So all the information is there and everybody gets the same information and then what they choose to bring to group and how they choose to use each week's topics is different for every group. Yeah. And although I know that you've, as I said, had other groups before, it was pretty funny because I couldn't imagine the exact conversations that we had, you know, happening with any other groups of people. Mm -hmm. And I mean, honestly, we had a a decent sized group. And when I showed up at the beginning, I was a little wary because usually if it's like three or four people, I'm okay. And then if it gets bigger, I start to feel like there are too many people there. Mm -hmm. But that shook off pretty quickly. Yeah, your group was six, which is a really nice sized group. Yeah, it was good. And it was great because it felt like everybody overlapped with everybody else in some way, but then was different in another way. And so we had a lot of of good sort of perspectives and experiences that everybody was able to kind of put in and talk about. Yeah, yeah. How was it being with a group of other HSPs, neurodivergent folks? I know you kind of touched on this before. Yeah, it was, I I do feel like we all, as I sort of mentioned earlier, we all sort of started, started a little bit more guarded. And by the time we got to the middle, I would say, of the course, I felt like I was showing up differently. And I felt like the whole cohort, everybody else was showing up differently too. Not necessarily fundamentally differently, but maybe just more, more thoroughly. Yeah. It usually takes about four weeks for the group to really get cohesive. Although some groups in your group was one that I felt on the first night was very cohesive, but it generally takes about four weeks, which is why I have it go for 10 weeks, because that gives time for group formation from that time when people settle in a little bit more to go a little bit deeper. Yeah. And it did feel kind of the first night like it sort of felt full of promise where everybody was just sort of participating from the get go. And I noticed I wasn't hiding, which is, you know, again, new for me in a group. (laughs) Sure. Sure. Yeah. Did you feel seen and heard and honored? I did. I did. As you and I discussed, because we had been in touch beforehand, Mm -hmm. I trusted that you know, you would be sensitive to my experience and that you've been through some of the same things yourself. And so I I knew that I would get that from you. What I didn't necessarily expect is the level of sort of the same that I got from the other members of the group. I felt like everybody really showed up and I had to do some educating and about sort of this is how autism shows up in people who are highly masked. And and instead of getting any sort of pushback, people were just genuinely curious and they wanted to learn more about how, why I was there, how it overlapped and sort of, it, it sort of felt like we all had so many of the similar experiences that nobody was really preoccupied with the fact that, you know, I showed up in different papers than they did. Right, right. And one of the things that you and I had discussed at some point later, when Jen and I created the HSP group, obviously I identified as an HSP and didn't know that autism was going to be down the road. So all of the videos, we really emphasize HSP. And you and I had spoken later that probably what I could have done is to give you a heads up that, you know, there is no mention of neurodivergence. There is no mention of autism because when Jen and I created this, (laughs) I just thought I was an HSP. So that is something moving forward that if you do take the course and you identify as being neurodivergent, autistic, ADHD, that there is not that sensitivity. And because the videos, I think, are are so well done, 
that to go in and redo them to add that, I think would be a disservice. But I, I think people need to have a heads up about that. Did you want to say anything about that? Just that I think that it was obvious that the videos had been recorded. And so it was it wasn't something that, you know, knowing that it, it's sort of a recent discovery for you to the whole, you know, figuring out how autism fits in with all this. I didn't feel like it was a slight or anything. It was just sort of, OK, this might be a, a little incomplete. But then when we were in the classes, which was, you know, the, the actual courses where we were all meeting, it didn't feel remotely relevant that various other kinds of neurodivergence weren't particularly mentioned in the videos because the I would say the meat of it all is sort of taking the material, processing it how you want to process it or, you know, process it. I, I just sort of like interacted with the material in a way that was helpful and useful to me. And then I brought you know, my own perspective to class. So it was sort of like take it or leave it for participating in the course pick up what's useful and run with it and discard the rest. And and I felt like everybody kind of took that approach in different ways. And it ended up working out really great. And I had actually forgotten. I know we talked about that, but I actually had forgotten that that piece of it just because it it was so irrele- irrelevant to the process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I hear you. If someone were considering taking the course and, and what goes on for me is like, oh, that's a lot of money. I don't know these people. I hate being in groups. I hate being in groups. I'm more introverted. What would you say to them? And you don't have to address what I what my imagined perceptions of people saying are, but what would you want to let people know? Yeah, if if you're thinking that you're interested in taking the course, if you're thinking that you might be interested in taking the course, you're definitely interested if you know this podcast, you know that Patricia is really thoughtful and really great at having discussions. That also plays out. Uh, she's great at connecting with different people in different ways and meeting people where they want to be met. And she engineers a cohesive group in a way that I personally haven't experienced before, mm. where if people were having a hard time sharing or, you know, sort of needing help in coming to the group you have a way of just kind of offering people space to show up and then the group itself was really great so it was sort of you were uh you were the captain of our ship and um and it was a really collaborative really rich process so i was definitely not entirely sure that i wanted to join. And honestly, after the first class, I thought, okay, well, after the first session, I'm going to get something out of this probably. And that's good enough for me. And by the end, it was more than I could have imagined, honestly. Oh, yeah, it it really is a beautiful process. And it's interesting for me because I've been teaching these courses or this course for over five years now. And to see how I teach has changed. And I think I was very much in it in the beginning. And probably as I've grown, I really am taking more and more of a step back to really let the group form and create their own group norms. But everything is optional. So if you're someone who's like, I don't want to have to share, I don't want to like, you don't have to, you don't have to do homework. You don't have to watch the videos. Like everything is optional. And if you want to do that at some point in the future on your own, you can, that this really is about what works for you. And so much of what we experience is trying to fit in and look like we're neurotypical in a world that is not really designed for us. I really wanted to create a space that if you've had a bad day, if you're tired, if you're crabby, that this is still a safe place to come where you don't have to pretend like everything's okay. And I think creating that sense of safety when people get to a place where they're okay with that really makes it a nice place to be. I think it does. And I think, you know, I very much experienced the sort of feeling you were trying to create. So I I would uh, co-sign that. And then also I I did want to mention that having permission not to do the homework made me really want to do the homework. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I got a lot out of it. But I also knew that if I didn't prepare as much as I normally would, I would still be able to participate and interact and I wouldn't be showing up as 
you know, somebody who hadn't done the homework and is getting in trouble. Yeah, there's no checking. Did you do the homework? Are you prepared? There's none of that. It's totally up to you. There is one week where we have an exercise and I just let people know you don't have to do it. It's kind of a powerful exercise if you want to do it. And if not, that's okay. Everything is optional. So if if you do have a PDA profile, I think it's pretty PDA friendly. <laughs> I'd have to agree. Yeah. The question is, how are you feeling about the group ending? And I'm just going to ask it to you that way and then you can we're respond. Not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're not ending. We're doing follow-on group sessions for a little bit afterwards. And uh, thank you for making that option available. But then mm -hmm. also back to my previous note, we're, we're actually friends now. Like we're starting a book club. We are still connected. And it's something where at the beginning of the class, I didn't necessarily see any sort of any sort of connection between us, you know, out the other side. And you know, you've mentioned some groups stay in touch and keep working with you. And I thought, well, that's ridiculous. Why would people do that? <laughs> um, you know, it's like you go to a class and then you're done. And mm -hmm. it's just been so great getting to know everybody and being able to just show up as we are and talk to each other. And and so you know, in the spirit of parallel play, we are doing a, a book club, we're still doing group and we're, we're in touch, I think, in a way that had we not been through the course together, we wouldn't have ever engaged on that level. And we certainly wouldn't have met each other. But it was just, it was a really lovely experience. And I think that everybody in the course was great and brought something different. And mm -hmm. I don't know, I feel like I got a lot out of it and I feel like I got a really good group of friends out of it, which is definitely not on the list of things I even thought were possible. Yeah. Yeah. So I was kind of trying to decide, like, should I say this or not? And then I was thinking about the group members that did not continue in this extension. We decided to extend for five weeks. And at the end of five weeks, we'll look at if people want to extend some more. There's an, We're obviously recording this because there's another course starting and I really only use the time slot that the group is at for any groups. But so not everyone chose to continue. And I was really, well, I guess I want to ask you, how was it for you? We've had two meetings now. How was the shift in the group cohesion in the last two groups that we've had with the people that extended the group? I feel like we've tightened up in a way that I can explain either because there are fewer people or because we're the ones who opted in. But I do feel like, I don't know, it just feels different. It's sort of like when you have a certain number of people in a room, each person affects the percentage, you know, whatever percentage they have. And so with smaller groups, it's, it's going to have a different dynamic. But I do feel like some people weren't able to continue. And I would feel differently about that if we didn't have book club lining up. But I think it's been really great to be able to be in a smaller group and not have to get to know people all over again, because we've already done that. Right. And if you are one of the people that did not extend, thought about, should I say something? Should I not? It is not my intention at all to make you feel regret, to feel bad. Sometimes it was just a scheduling. Sometimes people wanted less consistency in the group, you know, and everybody's wants and needs are fine. But I really was pleased at how the cohesion of the group shifted when the people that continued moved on. And it feels like the conversation is just really flowing now, more so than it did when everybody was there. I think people feel like they have permission to take up more space now. I think so, too. And I also think that it's flowing well. And also, again, with it being a smaller group, it's sort of easier for me to see, sort of keep track of everybody else and see if anybody's holding back, see if I'm holding back or it's just I think it's an easier dynamic to deal with. But also, I think it's only easier not just because it was three people who continued, but three people who had spent 10 weeks getting to know each other and yeah. working through the curriculum. But I will tell you, I did a group once with three people and I would not do it again. That is too small for a new group. We need more people. And it did I, not go as well because we needed more people for a newer group. But 
for a drop down, it really worked. Yeah. No, I think that's right because I think the reason that our group, our full group was so great was that we were so different in so many ways. And if you were to just put our like bios up next to each other, you wouldn't possibly think that we would all just knit in and get along. And I think that's what brought the richness to it. Yeah. We need to wrap up, but I am having this gremlin. (laughs) I probably don't need to say this again, but I'm going to, that I love the group when everybody was there. It was a very cohesive group. It was a great group. And I don't mean to imply that it's better or it is different that it's smaller, but if there's anything that I've said has, that has implied that it was not a good enough group, that was not my intention and please forgive me. I personally think that my full group was the best group ever, but it's also the only <laughs> one I've ever done. <laughs> Ellie, is there anything else that you want to say before we wrap up? Thank you for offering the course. Honestly, it's been an absolute delight getting to know you, getting to know my course mates. And yeah, I just, when you asked me to share my experience about being on the course, I was like, okay, so three hours, four hours, how long do we want to talk about this? (laughs) So I appreciate the opportunity and I can't say enough good things about it. Oh, well, thanks, Ellie. I really appreciate it. I think that's all we have for today. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Ellie. And we'll talk to you later. Thanks. All right. Bye. Hey, again. So I'm curious to know, did this feel different if you've listened to other episodes that have interviews with people that have taken the online HSP course? You want to shoot me an email if you noticed anything different. And then I'm thinking, I'm I'm going to hold off what I'm thinking anyways. It's been a really rough couple of days. Everything's fine, but there's just been a lot. I had to take Mace to the vet yesterday. If you know about the respiratory stuff that's going around in dogs, my mom's dog started coughing. Maisie started coughing. We each took the dogs to the vet. They're both fine. They're on antibiotics. I think we caught it really early. There's just been a lot. So I'm, I'm a little bit of my frazzled self. And every day, I just keep hoping that I have a day with no stress and little things keep popping up. So I'm stumbling a little bit more than normal. I'm okay with that. If you are interested in working with me, you can reach me at unapologeticallysensitive.com. If you're interested in the next online HSP course, if you're autistic, that works for you to take it also. The next course will start on Monday, February 5th, and it will go through April 15th, 2024. There is a day that we're not going to meet because President's Day. Registration is going to start on January 10th and go through January 16th for early bird registration at $675. Registration will continue January 17th through the 24th. The price will go up a little bit to $700. So that means that it's less than $70 for an hour and 20 minutes. It will go from 3 p.m. to 4.20 Pacific Standard Time every week for 10 weeks. These courses are really powerful. And what you heard Ellie talk about is the cohesion and this sense of being with people that are wired like you, even though there's a tremendous amount of diversity and difference, that not everybody is the same, but the sense of community and belonging can be really powerful. The topics that we cover in the course are expectations and disappointments, mindfulness and self-compassion, identifying negative messages and turning them into superpowers, perfectionism, embracing our emotions, self-care is non-negotiable, boundaries, communication, authenticity, and vulnerability, and creating a lifestyle that honors EHSP. So there's great curriculum. Every week you get an email that has a link to a video on that topic. There's some extra links if you want to do a little bit of extra learning. And then the group is really open to discuss whatever you want. So if you're struggling with things personally or you have examples of where you're struggling with boundaries or perfectionism, you bring it to group and we talk about it. People always seem to relate to it. I don't know, that that connection that happens in these groups is just, I love watching it. I love leading groups. It just is very special. I think that that's all I have to say. I hope you are having a good new year. What is it that you want to create in this new year? Remember. 
sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's how your brain is wired. You have a right to take up space. You have a right to feel everything that you feel. You have a right to have big feels, little feels, no feels. It's okay if people don't like you, don't understand you, don't get you. You're not for everyone and everyone is not for you. You have a right to pursue the things that are important to you. You have a right to stim, to make noise, to wiggle, to shake, to do whatever it is that brings you joy, to engage in your special interests, to info dump. You have a right to love being with animals, love being alone, love being with people, love moving your body. It's okay to feel irritable. It's okay to feel cranky. However you're showing up, messy, imperfect, loud, quiet, all of you is really okay. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for being a listener. I think that's all I have to, to say. Welcome 2024. Have a blessed day. 